It is good to be back here in Mankato, and I've been looking forward to sharing this message with you. Uh, a couple weeks ago, last time I was here on Sunday morning, Etienne shared some thoughts before we took the Lord's Supper together, and he got me thinking. Um, he asked us, why, why is it, if Christ can set us free from our sins, why is it that we still sometimes sin? Why would we make that choice, or why, why would we stumble? Why would we do what we do not want to do? And that's a very real thing that happens to us sometimes. Paul describes that struggle in Romans 7. He talks about how he does the thing that he doesn't want to do, and that he doesn't do the thing that he wants to do. And it can be frustrating. You can sense the frustration in Paul when he's talking about it. Um, and we might be frustrated as well sometimes by that situation that occurs. You know, if I want to do the right thing, why don't I do it every time? Why must we struggle against our own flesh? The answer that Etienne pointed out also got me thinking. It was from 1 Corinthians 2, and it talked about how the natural man or, or the fleshly man can't understand the things of the Spirit. It's the idea that there's a part of us that doesn't understand spiritual things, which is often referred to in Scripture as the flesh. Um, and then as luck would have it, as I was continuing to think about these things, um, the Sunday, last Sunday, uh, I got to listen to a speaker who preached from Romans 8, and he was talking about the spirit and the flesh. And Romans 8 is an incredible chapter. It seems like I've heard so many people preach or teach from Romans 8, and yet they've all drawn out different things from it. It's just a, a chapter with such incredible depth. And so I've been thinking about all of that and doing some personal study and have come to the biblical importance of this concept of crucifying the flesh. We should really start by asking, what is the flesh? Because if we just talk a lot about crucifying the flesh but don't know what we're talking about, then it might not help us very much. So what is the flesh? Sometimes I like to, to talk about what something is by also talking about what it is not. Does the flesh simply mean the physical body? You know, a lot of times when we read through a passage and it's talking about the flesh and the spirit, it seems pretty natural, almost obvious, to think about that as the physical body and the spiritual soul. So there's a physical part of you and then there's a spiritual part. And more today than in past centuries, we in our culture tend to think of ourselves as physical bodies with spiritual souls that are two very distinct things. So we might read a lot of passages and think that the flesh just means the physical body. Well, in a certain sense, we know that's not exactly what it means by the flesh, because then crucify the flesh would literally mean crucify your physical body, um, which is not something that Scripture commands us to literally physically do. But we still might think of it basically as just the physical body in that it's, it's a temptation to interpret Scripture in such a way that you think of your body as sinful, and bad and wrong, and that, that there's just something wrong with your physical body. But that's not necessarily true, not, not universally true. Um, for instance, in Genesis 2-7, we read that the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. So our bodies were something that was created by God in those seven days of creation, and we read in Genesis 1.31, God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. So this is every indication that God looked at the physical bodies of Adam and Eve that he had created and said they are very good. Ephesians 5.28-30 also speaks of the body in a way that is favorable and, and shows that it should be respected. It says husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. So implied in that is the fact that men ought to love their own bodies. It says, He who loves his own wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body. So it doesn't say that you should be disgusted by the fact that you have a physical body and it's just a bad thing. It says that people nourish and cherish their own physical bodies, even here referred to as flesh. Or 1 Corinthians 6.13, um, it describes the situation in which people had separated the spiritual and the physical so far in their mind that they felt like physical things didn't matter 
let's just focus on the spiritual things. Um, and they said, food for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both of them. And from context, you can see that the Corinthians were using this phrase, food for the stomach and the stomach for food, to say that, well, it doesn't really matter what our bodies do because God doesn't care about that physical stuff. But Paul responds, the body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. So it seems like he's saying, look, the physical body has a purpose and has a role and can be used to glorify God. It's not an inherently bad thing. Yes, it can be used for wrong purposes. But that might be a good place for us to start when thinking about these passages about the flesh and the spirit, is that they don't teach that our bodies are just inherently bad. Maybe it's not just the physical body, but the desires of the physical body. Maybe we could start to think more and more critically, try to zero in on what, what it is about the flesh, what the scripture means when it says the flesh, uh, what it is that we should be crucifying and putting to death by the spirit. Maybe it's the desires of our physical body. In a sense, that might be true. But again, you could consider, even from scripture, that there are desires of the physical body that are not just written off as inherently sinful. You know, even Jesus prayed in Matthew six eleven to God, give us this day our daily bread. And it may have been a symbolic statement that involved more than simply bread, but it indicates that our bodies have physical needs, and when we don't have bread, we get hungry. We have this physical sensation of, of desire for food. And Christ was praying to God that he would fulfill those physical needs of our bodies. In fact, uh, Jesus was a frequent attender of feasts, you can see in the Gospels, and it seems that he recognized and legitimized the reality that our bodies have physical desires that have proper fulfillment. Yes, there's an improper way, but also a proper way to fulfill them. Um, you can see that Christ was comfortable with the concept of us having physical desires that need fulfillment because uh, he ate and drank at feasts enough that some people accused him, wrongfully of course, of being, uh, of being a gluttonous man and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. And he said, yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. Maybe not the desires of the physical body, but physical passions associated with the body. And perhaps we're trying to narrow in on what, it, what Scripture means when it speaks negatively of the flesh. But even here, I, I think we should be careful about drawing uh, a line where Scripture hasn't drawn it about what is wrong with the flesh. There are even passions that we experience in our bodies that are not shown to be wrong. Um, the Bible does talk about sex, and this is one of those passages in Proverbs 5, 8, and 9, just as a warning. Um, it says, Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth. As a loving hind and a graceful doe, let her breast satisfy you at all times. Be exhilarated always with her love. So Proverbs indicates that it is appropriate for us to be exhilarated. That sounds like a passionate word sometimes by things that are experienced, at least partially, by our physical bodies. Uh, of course, this is in the context of marriage, but it illustrates that even physical passion itself is not inherently wrong. Um, and there are plenty of things that we might be passionate about from a physical standpoint. Um, some people are passionate about good tasting food, about making culinary creations and enjoying them. You might be passionate about the feeling of falling on a roller coaster. Some people love to ride roller coasters. I'm not one of them. Um, some people love physical activity and even intense physical activity because of the endorphins associated with, for instance, running. And scripture doesn't speak negatively of those things as if they are inherently sinful. I'd like to suggest to you and then show you from scripture what I believe scripture would use to define the flesh and what's wrong with it. I believe that these passages that we'll look at speak of the flesh as the undiscerning instincts of the flesh. Undiscerning meaning the physical body doesn't use higher thinking to determine which things it should and should not be attracted to. And we know that on a very basic level. I mean, how many times has someone wanted to go on a diet? They've wanted to not eat the cupcake, you know, from a, 
from a higher order level of thinking, like logically that's what they want to do. But that doesn't mean your body just aligns itself with what your mind wants. Uh, there are times when our flesh seems undiscerning. So here's that passage that was shared from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 12 through 16. It says, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God, which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. So there's this message of the gospel, and it's a spiritual message, and it's been given to us by God in spiritual words, and we want to understand it. But there's a problem. It says, but a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. And indeed, many people in our world look at the gospel, and they think it's foolishness, and they don't understand it. And it actually says here, and he cannot understand them, because they are spiritually appraised. And then it says, but he who is spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord, that he will instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. So this natural man, or this fleshly man, as we'll look in other passages as well, doesn't understand spiritual things, and the text goes further. It says he cannot understand them. Well, we realize that, as I've said, sometimes our physical bodies... Uh, you can't reason with them the way you can reason with a mind, you know, a spiritual mind that can understand different concepts. Our bodies just undiscerningly uh, reach for the things that they want and can't understand spiritual things, and thus this struggle takes place. If you look at that, that phrase, he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. That's what the New American Standard says. I want to draw out some other translations as well. For instance, he's not able to understand them because they're spiritually discerned. He's not able to understand it since it is evaluated spiritually. Or they seem to be nonsense because their value can be judged only on a spiritual basis. You know, our bodies are good for a lot of things. But one thing they're not very good at is evaluating a moral situation and discerning what we should or should not do and using sound judgment. That's what we have to use our minds, our spirits, our higher order thinking in order to do. Another passage that illustrates this concept about the flesh would be 2 Peter 2, 9-14. It says, The Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment, and especially those who indulge the flesh and its corrupt desires, and despise authority. So it's talking about those who indulge the flesh here, and this is the description that is given. It says, Daring, self-willed, they do not tremble when they revile angelic majesties, whereas angels who are greater in might and power do not bring a reviling judgment against them before the Lord. But these, like unreasoning animals, born as creatures of instinct to be captured and killed, reviling where they have no knowledge, will in the destruction of those creatures also be destroyed, suffering wrong as the wages of doing wrong. They count it a pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are stains and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions as they carouse with you, having eyes full of adultery that never cease from sin, enticing unstable souls, having a heart trained in greed, accursed children. The part that we're focusing on here as it seems to relate directly to that that passage from Corinthians, is that these people are described as unreasoning animals or creatures of instinct, just as the natural man in Corinthians is described as not being able to discern spiritual things. You know, uh, there's been a lot in the news lately about this, this man who abused a lot of girls that he was training in gymnastics. And we look at troubling situations like that and we ask how could anyone ever do such a thing i think the answer is in scripture the answer is that the flesh doesn't ask what the consequences will be the flesh doesn't use reasoning it doesn't spiritually discern things it just wants what it wants and if we live by the flesh and if we continue to walk down that road and become weaker and weaker in spirit and stronger and stronger in flesh we become mastered by a flesh and we just follow it wherever it leads. 
and it's like an unreasoning animal, a creature of instinct. Um, humans can do some terrible things, and I think this explains why. And I think it it shows clearly what Scripture means by the flesh and why we must crucify the flesh. So if you think about things in these terms, we all have instincts, physical instincts, that while not inherently wicked, must be accompanied by discernment or they will lead us to sin. And there's different categories. Here's just some categories that come to mind. One is sexual interest and desire. It's not spoken of in Scripture as universally, inherently wrong, but it's spoken of as something that must be accompanied by discernment. Um, Desire for food, especially from experience, we can say food that has a lot of sugar or fat or complex carbs. Um, And our bodies were designed to be hungry for these things because in nature, if you find something with a lot of sugar, it probably has a lot of nutrients with it too. Um, we We need to have these instincts to help us, but we must also use discernment with them. Uh, our adrenaline or our fight or flight response. You know, one aspect of the flesh that we haven't really mentioned yet, but which is definitely relevant, is that of anger and being enraged, letting our anger get the best of us. You know, in many ways, that's a physical response that happens to us, where our blood pressure rises and um, and our body reacts. Re- our body reacts very violently to um, to feelings and experiences that we have. Also, the desire for rest and relaxation. Obviously not a bad thing, but it would be if we just rested any time we ever felt like it. Um, And then there's the general drive for different kinds of chemicals, you know, endorphins, dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin. All those things are in us because they've been designed to lead us to what we need, but they also have to be accompanied by a mind that, that is guided by God, that is taught to discern things. You could look at these bullet points and you could ask, if the world did not have these things, what would it be like? Um, Well, it wouldn't be very good if if any of these were just taken away. Um, If there were no sexual interest or desire, it's um, quite probable that the population of the earth would just dwindle down to nothing. Um, The sexual desire, I've wondered often, why did God give that to us? It seems maybe that he's given it to us in order to encourage us to better ourselves and to enter into long-term relationships in which we can learn uh, important truths about love and about self-sacrifice. The desire for food, and especially foods that, at least in their natural forms, would be highly nutritious for us, is what keeps us from getting malnutrition. Um, And it also encourages us to work together in things like agriculture, Um, towards a a common task that we have that's necessary for our survival. And there's a lot that we learn in that process. Uh, Adrenaline and the fight or flight response, obviously very valuable in times when they truly are needed. Um, But we would need to use discernment, for instance, when we're just, uh, you know, getting angry at someone's Facebook post or something and about to say something we shouldn't say. Um, The same for desire for rest and relaxation or for any instinct we have. So I hope you can see from Scripture how Our bodies have undiscerning instincts, but the problem is they're undiscerning and that they must be discerned spiritually by the Spirit or will be led quickly astray. And Paul, in in the passage I referenced where he struggles with doing the right thing uh, or being led astray, lays that out. He says, what I'm doing I do not understand, for I'm not practicing what I would like to do, but I'm doing the very thing I hate. So Paul's using discernment. I mean, there's a part of him that's discerning, but he doesn't always do what he knows he should. He says, if I do the very thing I do not want to do, I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good. So now no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh, that is, in this undiscerning uh, physical instinct that, that goes astray. He says, for the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. For the good that I want, I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not want. But if I'm doing the very thing I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. Which is an interesting concept that we could spend more time on as well, that that Paul recognizes there's a distinction between him and his sin. And he 
recognizes that he has the spirit of Christ in him, teaching him the truth, and that he knows that truth and wants to follow it. So he says, I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. For I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man, but I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin which is in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then on the one hand I myself with my mind, I'm serving the law of God, but on the other with my flesh, the law of sin. So that's the problem. Uh, The problem is this struggle that we have that if we're not careful, we can just fall into and it won't be a struggle anymore, but it'll be a slavery to the flesh. How do we escape that? That's the, the title of the sermon. Crucify the flesh. Galatians 5.24 says, Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passion and desires. Now this may be obvious, but do we stop to consider how violent a term crucify is? Because God is a God of, of grace and mercy and love, and he's always telling us to forgive other people. But then when he talks about our own flesh, he says, crucify it. He doesn't tell us to go easy on it, to make peace with it, to reason with it. He says, crucify it. Romans 8, 13 says, if you're living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Colossians 3, 5 says, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Now, this may also seem really obvious too, but I had a like a light bulb moment this week, and this is what I wanted to share with you. I realized that sometimes, in my case, instead of crucifying the flesh, I try to reform the flesh. You know, I try to just reason with it and change it a little bit. Uh, instead of putting it to death the moment it begins to, tip me, to tempt me, I open up a dialogue with it. I try to convince my body to start using discernment. Uh, I try to make myself feel a different physical feeling about the situation. Um, As if I can't do the right thing unless my body agrees with me. But that's not what scripture says. It doesn't say reform the flesh. It says crucify the flesh. That there's a part of us that's undiscerning that just has to go. Um, And we could bring in other metaphors besides crucify that could help build the picture too. Because um, as we know, just because you crucified the flesh today doesn't mean that you're not going to continue to experience its influence tomorrow. And so I might add that not only must we crucify the flesh, but I guess you have to ignore it. Um, You have to overcome it. It's still going to talk to you. Um, But that doesn't mean you have to listen. And Romans 8, 7 then says, The mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. This is why you can't just reason with the flesh, why you have to crucify it, why you can't just try to change it and reform it. Instead, you just have to ignore it completely. It's because the flesh, it cannot understand. The mindset on the flesh is not able to subject itself to the law of God. It's like trying to teach a rock to understand Shakespeare. You can't teach your body to understand spiritual concepts. It's a physical thing. Um, so John fourteen sixteen through 17 says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever. That is, the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it does not see him or know him. But you know him, because he abides with you and will be in you. You know, if we just follow the natural course of the world, we won't be able to see him. We cannot receive him. Um, we have to have his Spirit to help us. It makes me think of what Daniel's friends said to King Nebuchadnezzar um, when he wanted them to bow down to the statue that he'd made. He said, now if you're ready, at the moment you hear the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, psaltery, and bagpipe, and all kinds of music, to fall down and worship the image that I've made very well. But if you do not worship, you will immediately be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire, And what God is there who can deliver you out of my hands? So Nebuchadnezzar, I mean, he's basically acting like uh, a mischievous two-year-old who's throwing a tantrum. He makes the statue, and they say, no, we're not going to bow down to it. 
And Nebuchadnezzar says, oh, well, if you don't do what I say, there's going to be consequences. And that's what our bodies can sometimes do. Um, that's what the flesh can do. It throws a tantrum when it doesn't get what it wants. And they say, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. It's like, we already made our mind. We don't need to reason with you anymore. We don't need to have a long argument. And that's sometimes what people say to their children, right? This discussion is over. We're not going to argue about it anymore. I think sometimes that's what you have to say to your flesh. I know what you want, but we're not going to talk about it anymore. Um, and that's what they said to Nebuchadnezzar, uh, regardless of his tantrum. And they were willing to deal with the consequences. So they lived by the Spirit and overcame the flesh. And Galatians 5, 16-18 does draw out the fact that it's not just a one time you put to death the flesh, you never deal with it again, but it's a daily walk. It says, but I say walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you're led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. So just because we put the flesh to death in baptism, and, and Romans 6 teaches that that is when um, we die to our old selves and are right, raised up to new life, just because we put the flesh to death then doesn't mean that we won't also have to take up our cross daily, as Jesus says, and die daily, as Paul says. It's going to be an ongoing fight, and when we fall, we must get back up, and we can walk by the Spirit, which means when the flesh speaks out, we reject it. So here's a summary of what we said. The flesh in Scripture often refers, not always, you do have to look at context, but it often refers to the undiscriminating instincts and desires of the body. Because it lacks discernment, the flesh will lead us to hell if it is not mastered by the discerning spirit. The flesh cannot be reasoned with. It literally cannot understand spiritual things. It's like people say, you would argue with a fence post. That's, that's what it's like trying to get the flesh to understand spiritual things. Therefore, the only course of action is to crucify the flesh. Crucifying the flesh is an ongoing battle that we must engage in daily. If we fight the good fight, we will win by God's grace. And here's the last point, which we haven't really covered yet, but which I'd like to close with. And that is that resisting the flesh without the Spirit of God in you is a losing battle. Plenty of people all over this world have recognized that the, the instincts of their flesh um, aren't always the best instincts. That they don't always have the best discernment when they just do whatever the flesh asks them to do. And they want to overcome it. But you have to have the Spirit of God or it's a losing battle. In Romans 8 again it says the mindset on the flesh is death but the mindset on the Spirit is life and peace because the mindset on the flesh is hostile towards God for it does not subject itself to the law of God for it is not even able to do so and those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Then it says, however, you are not in the flesh but in the Spirit if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. So it doesn't just say, if indeed you have a mind and you use it, but it's actually the Spirit of God that helps you overcome the flesh. He even says, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. talks over and over again about how His Spirit is in us, and it's His Spirit that helps us overcome the flesh. So if you want to crucify the flesh, you'll never succeed without the Spirit of God to help you. And this is how you get it. Acts 2.38, Peter said to them, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then his spirit is in us to help us. Titus 3.5 says he saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. And so as many of us as have been baptized into Christ, we have this gift of the Holy Spirit. God is there with us, ready to fight 
with us to give us what we need to overcome the flesh uh, as, we, as we strive to walk by the Spirit day in and day out. Um, if, you've, if you've never received that Spirit, I can't conclude but from Scripture that you're fighting a losing battle without it. If you do have it, be encouraged. And don't despair because the flesh still speaks to you. It may always be there, but understand that you can still crucify it, that you can still do what the friends of Daniel did and say, I don't need to answer you anymore on this matter. And with God's help, uh, we can have that victory. If we can help you in any way, please come as we stand and sing this morning.